have shown. My name is Mark Wood. I'm a captain with the Bath Fire Department. Uh, this idea started about a year ago. We've worked very closely uh, with Bath Housing. This is Deborah Keller from Bath Housing Authority. And in the last year or so, we've been trying to come up with ideas uh, to reach out into the community and talk about uh, fire safety and fire safety for landlords. Uh, we know that there's um, a lot of responsibility that goes with being a landlord. And given, especially the last year, uh, with some of the fires that we've had in the state of Maine, um, we really wanted to make an effort to reach out and speak to the community about fire safety. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, a supervisor from the State Fire Marshal's Office, Mark Stevens, that's going to do the bulk of the presentation. We also have Scott Davis, uh, City of Bath Code Enforcement, and we have Larry French from the American Red Cross that's going to speak after Mr. Stevens. Um, part of the reason why we wanted to do this was not just to give you the information to let you know what's out there for resources. The fire department, Bath Housing, the fire marshal's office, the Red Cross. You know, there's a lot of resources in the city of Bath and we want to make sure that if you have any questions or concerns, that you know who you can reach out to, okay? Uh, so I'd like to introduce Deb Keller from Bath Housing. Thanks, it's great to see so many people here tonight and thank you to Steve Roy for recording this um, so that we can play it on the cable access TV um, so we can reach more people. Um, with this really important message. So Bath Housing owns and manages 162 apartments in Bath, and um, housing quality is really of the utmost importance to us. Um, we have been working closely with Bath Fire Department, as Mark explained, um, making sure that we're doing the best practices in our own apartments in terms of regular fire drills, um, uh, testing the alarm, everything we need to be doing as a landlord to make sure our residents are safe. Um, but we did, Bath Housing also administers the Housing Choice Voucher Program in this area, and we work with a lot of you as landlords in that program, and it's really a good opportunity to collaborate, um, as Mark was saying, collaborate in the community to make sure everybody understands the resources, and that we keep this issue top of mind. Um, we don't want our community to be in the news like we've seen in the last couple of years with tragedies, um, and we all want to keep our tenants safe, and I think we all share that goal. Um, and I'll just say, tenants do have responsibilities, um, and you all know that, and I'll just say it again, is that it, it is their responsibility to test the, um, their smoke detectors regularly, um, not to disable an alarm, and to notify the landlord of problems. Um, but we too, as landlords, have responsibilities, and that's some of what we're going to learn about tonight. Um, so welcome, and look forward to tonight. Um, I want to introduce uh, staff for Bath Housing that is here and is available to answer any questions you might have about um, how these issues affect participation in the Housing Choice Voucher Program. We have Andy Parks, Nick Simon, Chris Bennett, and Josh Dubois from um, Bath Housing all here. So um, again, welcome and Hi, So we contacted um, Mark Stevens from the Fire Marshal's Office about a month ago. Uh, he was happy to come here and do this presentation. He's done it um, several times all over the state of Maine. Um, after his presentation, we're going to have a presentation from Larry French. And at the end, we want to open it up to Q&A and have a very informal um, session where you guys can ask any questions. And all of us will be here to answer them. Okay, does anybody have any questions to start? Okay. Mark Stevens from the State Fire Marshal's Office. Okay. Thanks for coming out tonight, everyone. Really appreciate it, and uh, especially if you, uh, you know, when I'm asked to come and talk to folks about laws, codes, and standards, it's not exactly a riveting topic that people are lining up to come listen to. So, um, if I interject some humor tonight, it's not because I don't take my job seriously. It's because if I don't, it's going to be a long 45 minutes. So, um, but I want everybody to get something out of this. I want to be able to. Uh, you know, impart some knowledge on you. Um, you know, what are the landlord responsibilities? What are the tenant responsibilities? And some of that is actually outlined in law. So we're going to talk about some of the specifics. Um, so just to start off with an open question, what is a safe building? And, to, and we're talking about fire safety, life safety in buildings. What is a safe building? Any shots in the dark on that? Basically, a safe building in terms of fire safety related is a, a concrete building located underwater. Well, that's obviously not practical, so um, the state of Maine has adopted codes that dictate what are the minimum standards for a safe building in the state of Maine. And those codes relate to hospitals, nursing homes, 
single family dwellings, apartment buildings, any type of building that you can put people in, there are codes in place to make sure that the occupants of that building are assured a reasonable degree of safety. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those codes tonight and some of the laws that the states put in place to make sure that um, the buildings that, especially the buildings we use as housing, uh, meet minimum standards. So to start off with, there are a lot of confusing terms when we start talking about laws, codes, and standards, especially related to apartment buildings. Um, a law is an act passed by a legislative branch of government. So the main state legislature passes a law, the governor signs it. It becomes law in a specified period of time. Well, that's sort of, that's the chief or the king in terms of the authority um, over safety in the state of Maine. Uh, at the municipal level, it could be an ordinance. If the city of Bath passes an ordinance relating to fire and life safety in buildings, that carries the force of law at the local level. So underneath law, you have codes, which is a document that's written by a consensus committee that has specific focuses and goals. Maine has adopted NFPA 101 Life Safety Code, uh, the 2009 edition. That code is concerned with the safety of the occupants of the building. It doesn't care about the building whatsoever because the code recognizes that the building can be replaced, but the occupants obviously can't be replaced. So the goal of that code isn't necessarily to save the building. There may be some things in that code that help to save the building, but the goal is to get the occupants out. A standard is a, um, a technical document that contains specific instructions. Let's say that um, you have to install smoke detectors in your buildings. There are standards out there. One of those standards is NFPA 72 that tell you how those smoke detectors have to be installed. But in order for those standards to kick in, the code has to require them. So there's actually a chain. Uh, coming from the fire service, it's sort of like the chain of command. The chief is the, is the overriding authority of the fire department. And then you might have a captain that's in charge of a shift. And then you have the firefighters. So a law is the chief. The code might be the captain and the standards of the firefighter in terms of their authority. So laws have the highest level of authority. Anytime a law and a code conflict, and we're going to see some instances where they do when we start looking at the particulars specific to the state of Maine, the law will take precedence all the time. Laws may reference a code for compliance. When that occurs, it's considered to have the force of law. Um, technically, any violations of the Life Safety Code in the state of Maine are a Class E crime. So the Life Safety Code carries the force of law in the state of Maine because it's given that authority by the law. Again, codes are subordinate to law, um, are written in legally enforceable language, so they're not exactly good bedtime reading. Um, well, actually, if you want to fall asleep, you open up a code book, and I can guarantee you five minutes later you're going to be dozing off. Uh, they're generally revised every three to five years based upon trends in fire loss and advances in technology. The National Fire Alarm Code has probably doubled in thickness over the past six years. Just because more technology is becoming available, that technology makes the goals of that particular standard more achievable, um, so the standard increases in thickness. I brought with me a, a 1961 edition, or 63 edition, of the Life Safety Code. the size of a pamphlet. Um, I really wish that, you know, this would be a really easy code to navigate in terms of enforcement, but the current standard is about eight times this size. So what's changed since 1963 in terms of our understanding of fire events in buildings and hazards to the occupants? People have died. Mm -hmm. So we've looked at those fire losses and said, okay, well, we've been able to establish that if you have a big wide open stairway that extends four stories in a building, that generally doesn't bode well for the occupants if a fire starts on the first floor of the building. So that's just one example of where the code has sort of evolved over time as we've looked at some of those high loss of life and high dollar loss fire events and have put those into, uh, into the code. And it's not any one person that writes the code, it's a consensus group. That consensus group may be folks that are involved in the industry. For example, one of the, uh, one of the groups that was part of the uh, 
co-development process for hotels and motels was actually um, Radisson, uh, involved in the hotel industry, and they contribute to the code. They're not given a, a majority opinion in the code, but they certainly have a voice in the code as well. So it's a consensus document. A lot of people get together, they vote, and then they determine what the requirements are going to be, and they have to be subject matter experts in their fields. Any questions so far? Is everybody still awake? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I've done my job. Okay, again, standard just subordinate codes. Standard might be the fire alarm code. If you have to sprinkle your building, it might be um, NFPA 13, the standard for the installation of sprinkler systems. So they have the lowest authority. So it, just because the uh, just because the sprinkler code says that sprinklers have to be located at least four inches off the wall doesn't automatically mean that every building in the state of Maine has to be sprinkled. The code has to give that standard its authority. And if you have to install that particular item, the standard is going to tell you how to install it. All right. So now that we've looked at the relationship between laws, codes, and standards, um, probably the best thing to do would be to work our way down and start looking at some of the laws in the state of Maine that specifically re relate to apartment buildings. The first one's uh, Title 25, Section 2452. That's where we adopt the Life Safety Code. That particular statute says that the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety in the state of Maine can adopt codes or standards or rules that affect fire and life safety of buildings. That's getting back to what is a safe building. Well, the, the law allows for the establishment of a standard of care, so to speak. It sets the, the bottom line. And the codes represent a minimum standard. As we start talking about some of the specifics, keep in mind that the codes represent a bare minimum. There's nothing that's going to prohibit you from going above and beyond the code. You just can't be less stringent than the code. It sets a bare minimum. Um, there's a statute, t Title 25, Section 2361, which provides authority for certain municipal officers to enforce the codes and standards adopted by the state of Maine. If your particular community doesn't have any codes or standards adopted, and the town council or the city council gives the local fire official, the fire chief, or the local code enforcement officer the authority to enforce those codes, they don't have to adopt them. They can adopt and enforce what the state already has in place. Uh, Mark, what do you have adopted here in the city of Bath? For a life safety code? Yes. Uh, an FBA Okay, so you have 101 adopted locally? Yes. Yep, okay. Yep. All right, two big ones we're going to talk about tonight, I'm sure are going to generate a lot of interest, are Title 25, Section 2464. This covers responsibility for installing and maintaining smoke detectors. And there's one particular subsection we're going to take a look at that specifically applies to rental units. And then Title 25, Section 2468 talks about carbon monoxide detectors and the requirements for carbon monoxide detectors in rental units. Um, we'll also talk about some of the changes to this particular law for carbon monoxide detection that's going to be taking effect January 1st. The legislature passed LD 623, which modifies this particular statute. Not a lot of changes to um, rental units. It affects more hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts. That's where the big changes are to that particular section. Okay, and actually before we go any further, PowerPoint presentation, and on the back side of that, you're going to see copies of the two statutes that we had in the previous slide here. Section 2464 at the top, it's labeled smoke detectors. If you look at Say smoke detectors at the top. 
and have one there for carbon monoxide detectors and one for smoke detectors. starts at section 1 and goes through, you can find section 9 under smoke detectors. It's going to have a bold heading that says rental units. It'll say title 25, 24, 64 at the top and it's going to be page 3 of 4 on that particular law. So this particular section of the law that covers rental units assigns responsibilities to both the landlords and the tenants when we talk about smoke detectors. So landlord responsibilities. At the time of each occupancy, the landlord shall provide smoke detectors if they are not already present. Smoke detectors must be in working condition. After notification and writing of any deficiencies by the tenant, the landlord shall repair or replace the smoke detectors. If the landlord did not know or had not been notified of the need to repair or replace the smoke detector, the landlord's failure to repair or replace the smoke detector may not be considered as evidence of negligence. So there's protective language in the statute for the landlord. Your tenants have to notify you in writing if there are problems with the smoke detectors. Landlord responsibility is to provide those smoke detectors in working condition at the time of tenancy. What I would strongly suggest is maintaining documentation having some sort of an acknowledgement form that the tenants can sign that, look, you moved into this unit, you were given working smoke detectors, and you were acknowledging receipt of those working smoke detectors as part of your lease agreement. Um, I would strongly suggest that, and then keeping that as part of your records. That's going to demonstrate that you met the law at the time of tenancy, or well, there's going to be a component of that. So the next section actually talks about the tenant responsibilities. The tenant shall keep the smoke detectors in working condition and charge the batteries in the smoke detectors by testing the smoke detectors periodically and by refraining from disabling the smoke detectors. So the tenants cannot disable the smoke detectors. If there's a problem with the smoke detector, they have to notify you in writing. If there's a violation of this particular section, it is actually a civil offense that carries a maximum fine. When do you see that enforced? As far as the tenants? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you mean if the tenants disable a smoke detector, there have been fire events where our office has taken enforcement action on the tenant when the tenant has acknowledged that they have disabled the smoke detector. So it's a civil summons. The maximum penalty under Maine state law is a $500 fine. That's the maximum, $500 fine for violating that particular section. You don't so, catch nothing. If we had more people, <laughs> and that's, you know, this is, this is good to be able to get out and talk to you folks talking about that in terms of, you know, getting the message out that there are these responsibilities out there. Um, you know, knowledge is power. The more that, that you know as a landlord, um, you know, the safer we're going to be able to keep the, the building. So. All right, so I just wanted to point out that there are some specific sections in the law that provide protection for you as a landlord and assign your tenants responsibilities. I know sometimes the mindset is, okay, well, when the tenants are building, a landlord fixes everything. Nobody's ever found that problem, right? Hmm. Um, the tenant does have some responsibilities under the law. So. When we look at carbon monoxide detection, there is a section in the carbon monoxide detector law that reads pretty much the same. So again, provide carbon monoxide detection, the tenant is to refer you from disabling the carbon monoxide detection and has to notify you in writing if there is a problem. All right, carbon monoxide detection, I'll touch on that real briefly before we move forward. Carbon monoxide detectors have to be powered by the building electrical supply with battery backup. Plug-in carbon monoxide detectors are completely acceptable under Maine state law. Carbon monoxide is much different than smoke. Smoke detectors obviously are going to be at the ceiling level because that's where the smoke is headed in a fire event. 
Carbon monoxide is about 97 to 98% as heavy as air by volume. It will distribute itself fairly evenly through a space. So if the manufacturer of that carbon monoxide detector says that a plug-in outlet 18 inches off the floor is fine, then that carbon monoxide detector will detect the presence of carbon monoxide reliably if it's functioning properly. So when you install carbon monoxide detectors, there are two things, battery or, or electrically powered with battery backup. Um, you're looking for carbon monoxide detectors outside the sleep, each sleeping area or in every bedroom. So outside the sleeping area or in every bedroom powered by the building electrical supply with battery backup. Combination smoking carbon monoxide detectors meet the law as well, provided that they're electrically powered with battery backup. So you can kill two birds with one stone and have your hardwired smoke detectors that are also carbon monoxide detectors, provided that they're placed appropriately, that will meet the intent of the law. Any questions on smoking carbon monoxide detection yet? Okay. All right, we talked about the life safety code. The life safety code was first adopted in the state of Maine in 1959. Um, for what it's worth, chapter 31 of the current edition covers existing apartment buildings. There is a misnomer out there that some things are grandfathered. The fire code looks at things as either new or existing. The only grandfathering is that you fall into the existing chapter if the building was standing and used as an apartment building before the adoption of the code. If the building was an apartment building in 1888, it has to comply with the requirements for the existing apartment buildings under the fire code. Okay, let's talk about grandfathering. It's a, it's a misnomer. It's, it doesn't exist. You have to meet the existing requirements for the particular type of building that you're using. Um, if you have a two-family rental, are you an apartment? Technically, the fire code says no. The apartment occupancy is a building or portion thereof containing three or more dwelling units with independent cooking and bathroom facilities. If you have a building with two rental units, you are a one and two family dwelling. The code requirements go down substantially. When you hit that third unit, that's where the bulk of what we're going to talk about tonight really kicks in. So one and two family dwellings are entirely separate from what we're talking about here tonight. Generally, in a one and two family dwelling, you're looking for two means of escape, smoke detection. That's pretty much it. Once you hit that third dwelling unit, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight kicks in. Um, local jurisdictions may have previous editions of the life safety code adopted the fire code. It all depends on what jurisdiction you're in. If state and local codes conflict, Maine is a what's called a home rule state, you're required to comply with the most restrictive. So for example, I'll throw out there that in the city of Gorham, or in the town of Gorham, um, new one and two family homes have to be sprinkled. The state of Maine does not make you sprinkle one and two family homes that are new. The town of Gorham does. So we'll get calls sometimes from folks in Gorham, for example, that say, hey, um, I'm being asked to sprinkle my house. Can you tell the town that I don't have to sprinkle it? No, we cannot tell the town anything. You have to comply with the stricter of the two requirements if there's a conflict. All right, so existing apartment buildings, there are four different compliance options that you can be broken into. And each one of those compliance options have their own requirements. An option one building is an apartment building that doesn't have an installed fire detection or suppression system. Buildings meeting option one have to be three stories in height or less and have 10 or fewer dwelling units. If your four stories or have more than 11 dwelling units or 11 or more dwelling units in a building, option one is not an option. Option two is buildings that are provided with a complete approved automatic fire detection and notification system. This is something that's more than smoke detectors. Smoke detectors are required in every apartment building. This would be a full fire alarm system with pull stations and horn strobes, heat detectors in the dwelling unit, stuff like that. That would be an option two building. 
Option three building is selected areas are going to be sprinkled. Your means of egress are going to be sprinkled. You may have sprinkler heads outside the doors to the apartments. Living units and other areas will not be sprinkled with fire sprinklers. And then an option four building, the whole thing is provided with a sprinkler system. Now, the big thing to remember with those four compliance options is when you start looking at travel distance to an exit, how far you have to be able, how close an exit has to be in the dwelling unit. When you start looking at the rating of doors and stairwells, or the rating of doors to individual apartments, the stricter requirement is going to be the one with the fewer fire protection features in it. So option one, you could be looking at 60 minute rated doors on apartments or on stairwells. Option four, you may be down to 20 minutes because it recognizes the value of that sprinkler system in the building. It recognizes the value of notification to the occupants of the fire alarm system in terms of giving them enough notice to get out of the building quickly. Okay, um, so once you've determined what compliance option your building fits into, uh, how do you proceed? There are two, as far as means of egress goes, there are two different concepts. Means of egress and means of escape. Means of egress is, how do I get out of the building once I'm outside the dwelling unit? So means of egress is, if this is the dwelling unit, once I'm outside the dwelling unit, where am I going? It's generally going to be two ways out. Means of escape is, how are you going to get out of the dwelling unit? If you're in the dwelling unit, let's say, and the worst case scenario happens and you're not able to leave the dwelling unit because of a fire event outside the dwelling unit, how do you get out of the building? So means of escape, means of egress are two different things. Um, so in most cases, means of egress you're going to have two. There's one simple reason for that, so that a single fire event is not going to block all of your exits. If you have two remotely located exits, one over here and one over here, a single fire event is not likely to block both of them. Some of the components of the means of egress, or some of the stuff you're going to see in the means of egress would be doors, interior and exterior stairs, existing fire escape stairs, new fire escapes on buildings are generally prohibited. Because a fire escape can be down to 18 inches in width, and what they have found is that in certain buildings, some folks don't want to use the fire escape because you look at a fire escape and you're like, yeah, if I had to. A set of stairs, on the other hand, is going to encourage the use for the occupants to get out of the building. It's going to be more user friendly. So fire escapes are generally not permitted to be added to a building. If they're already there, they can remain in place, um, but generally are not going to be, you know, if you had to add another exit to a building, it's not going to be a fire escape. It's going to be a full dimensional stair. And then, of course, your corridors. A lot of buildings will have units that dump into a corridor with two remotely located exits off the corridor. Any questions on means of egress? So again, your means of egress, the best way to think about it is once you're outside the dwelling unit, what are the requirements? Generally, it's going to be two exits. Means of escape is when you're in the dwelling unit. Uh, this is going to be from all normally occupied spaces in the dwelling unit. This is going to be from everything except for kitchens, bathrooms, and closets. So bedrooms, living rooms are going to be required to have some sort of a means of escape. There is a little bit of a, a misnomer on a means of escape. If you happen to be 20 feet above the ground, the fire code is not necessarily expecting the occupants of that particular space to jump 20 feet. The means of escape, when we start talking about egress windows, the means of escape is actually geared towards fire department ingress more so than folks jumping out. For example, an egress window has to have a minimum width of 20 inches. One of the reasons for that is when a ladder is placed against the window, it should span the width of the ladder. An egress window has to be within 20 feet of grade. The reason for that is because every fire department pumping apparatus in the United States has to carry a 24-foot extension ladder. If you place that against the building at an angle, it'll generally reach up to 20 feet. Not all communities are going to have ladder trucks. Not all sides of a building are going to be accessible to ladder trucks, so when the code talks about an egress window, it generally limits their use to within 20 feet of adjacent grade, and they have to be a certain size. 
In new buildings, it's actually 5.7 square feet of total area that you have to be able to open the window to. And again, that's not necessarily so that you or I could jump out that window 20 feet. It's more meant for the fire department to be able to gain access to that particular space. Window that you or I could get out right now versus a window that a firefighter wearing full protective clothing could get in would be two different things. Um, means of escape are generally excluded once you sprinkle the building. Sprinkling the building takes care of the means of escape, so you may not see egress windows in buildings that are equipped with a sprinkler system. Secondary means of escape can be from, uh, uh, can be a window, it also can be another door. If you have two doors leading out of a living room, for example, that go to different places, that can be a means of escape. Any questions so far? And again, everybody's still awake? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, an egress window is a window where the actual clear opening of the window measures at least 5.7 square feet and has minimum opening dimensions of 24 inches high and 20 inches in width. The window is not going to be more than 44 inches off the floor level. Again, this is geared more towards firefighters getting in to perform a rescue than it is folks getting out of the building. It's generally, if you have a fire in a building and, and heat starts to accumulate in the space, it generally doesn't bode well for the occupants if the fire department starts putting the fire out before they conduct the rescue. Because in some cases you may push that superheated air onto the victim, and what was a viable rescue is no longer going to be a viable rescue. So that's one of the reasons why there's requirements in the code for egress windows, and it should actually be called an ingress window because that's more or less what they're intended to do is to give the fire department an access point for rescue. Again, less than 20 feet above adjacent grade. If it's more than 20 feet, it has to open onto an exterior balcony or the fire department has to look at it and say, you know what, it's on the street side of the building, there's no power lines in the way, we can ladder that with an aerial ladder. Um, so if it's more than 20 feet above grade, you have three options. Option one, Sprinkle the building and the means of escape goes away. Option two, an exterior balcony outside the window to give folks a space to go out on so that the building's on fire, that they have more time to await rescue. Option three is the window's more than 20 feet above adjacent grade, but your fire department has the capability to reach that window given the apparatus that they have. Uh, other egress considerations, and these are just some uh, code requirements for apartment buildings. Common path of travel, if I'm in a space, it's the maximum distance that I have to travel before I reach my choice of two exits. So in this particular room, if that's my exit door, my common path of travel is going to be the amount of distance that I have to walk before I get out that hallway, and I can go in either direction. So that's the distance that I'm sort of confined to taking one exit path. That's limited because, again, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, so a single fire event's going to knock out your ability to escape the building. Um, dead end corridors, that's a corridor that you would walk down with no exit. It's limited to 50 feet. Lighting of the means of egress, obviously, if you're going to be able to see to get out of the building, even under conditions that aren't smoke filled, the egress has to be lit. Illuminated exit signs where more than one exit is required in existing apartment buildings. Um, if you're three or more dwelling units and more than one exit is required by code, you need illuminated exit signs similar to what's there. Uh, vertical openings or running closed stairs. They're bad because heat and smoke will travel up those stairs just like they do in a chimney, which doesn't Bode very well for the occupants that are above the fire level. Doors opening into stairs between floor levels are going to be self-closing and positively latching. So let's say that you have a fire in a first floor unit, the tenant leaves the, the, uh, the, the dwelling unit, the fire is in their dwelling unit, the door should close and latch behind them. That's going to buy the other occupants in the building more time to get out. If the door doesn't close and latch behind them, the corridor is going to fill with smoke, fire, 
we're going to lose the exit quicker than we would if that rated door closed and latched in place. And again, like we talked about before, there are requirements varying from 20 to 60 minutes for the doors opening in the dwelling units. And when you talk about fire resistance ratings, 60 minutes sounds like a long time, doesn't it, to get out of a building? But I'll tell you something about fire resistance ratings. The way that they test fire door assemblies, the way that they test fire walls, hasn't changed since 1918. It uses something called the standard time temperature curve. If you were to light a typical wastebasket full of paper on fire and apply it to the door or the wall, fire wall, fire door, that's about what the standard time temperature curve assumes. How many BTUs are in a typical building? A whole lot more than that. A 20 minute rated door under actual fire conditions, two to three minutes probably. So when you start talking about hours or minutes for fire resistance ratings, it's a false sense of security. The reason why they don't change this is because it would be really hard to go back and tell somebody that has a 20 minute rated door that they now have a three minute door. It would sort of turn the fire code upside down. So these time limits for rating of doors and walls, it's just a benchmark. That's all it is. It doesn't actually imply any sort of actual performance under fire conditions. Um, some vertical openings, you can have some openings between floor levels if your building is sprinkled. And again, it's relying heavily on the sprinkler system to put the fire out before it becomes a threat to the majority of the occupants in the building. These are some of the um, hazardous areas in an apartment building. Hazardous areas are generally going to be enclosed in fire resistive construction. Areas that are going to be considered to be hazardous areas in apartment buildings are going to be boiler rooms serving more than one unit, laundry rooms greater than 100 square feet, maintenance shops, storage areas, and trash collection rooms. If you have any of those in an apartment building, those would have to be enclosed in fire resistant construction because they're a greater degree of hazard than the dwelling units. Hazardous area separation is going to be one hour fire resistive construction. With the exception that if you have sprinklers, it's going to be smoke type with sprinklers. The theory is the sprinkler is going to control the fire in the hazardous area. The construction is only going to have to confine the smoke. Okay, we talked about smoke detection. Uh, one of the big questions is, where are you going to put smoke alarms? Smoke alarms are going to be required inside each bedroom and outside each separate sleeping area. You're going to have alarms on each level of the home, including the basement. One of the places, or some of the places you do not want to put smoke alarms, and the fire code actually discourages you from putting smoke alarms in these locations, would be kitchens, garages, bathrooms, and most, most attics, unless the local jurisdiction requires them to lock up attics. You don't want to put smoke alarms there because those aren't places where the environmental conditions are good for smoke detectors, and you're probably going to end up with a, a large number of false alarms in those locations. As far as placing smoke alarms, you can place them on the wall or the ceiling. You want to avoid this four inch pocket here at the wall and ceiling junction. What happens is, in a fire event, smoke likes to flow in a nice laminar, curved, shaped fashion. This right angle that's created by the junction of the wall and ceiling, it's going to result in a delay of the smoke detector picking up the smoke. You want some place where the smoke can flow by the detector very easily. So any place on the ceiling, but not within four inches of a wall, or on the wall, between four and 12 inches from the ceiling. You don't want to go any lower than 12 inches because the smoke's going to have to bank down a considerable distance before it reaches the smoke detector. But you don't want to go any closer than four because if you do that, you're going to get into that dead air pocket right up here. So that's where you want to put your smoke detectors. Any questions on that? Obviously, building service and utilities, we're expecting that the heating, the electrical system, those sorts of systems in the building are up to snuff. Um, the question was asked whether or not you can use space heaters in an apartment building.
Space heaters are not allowed in apartment buildings. Um, unvented fuel-fired heaters that are listed to be unvented are allowed in everything except for bathrooms and bedrooms and dwelling rooms. But the key is that the manufacturer of that particular heater has to say that this is an unvented appliance and it is listed for installation in a multifamily dwelling. You're not going to find a whole lot of those out there because the manufacturers don't like to buy the liability for that. It's possible but not likely that you're going to be able to install unvented heaters in an apartment. Um, if you suspect any sort of violation involving central heating systems, gas appliances, electrical systems, um, contact your local code enforcement or the main department of professional financial regulation. Those are the folks that actually regulate the licensing of electricians and heating technicians. Um, those folks do sometimes make mistakes, so if you're suspicious of whether or not an insulation meets code or not, as far as a national electrical code or a heating code, um, your local code enforcement officer of the Department of Professional Financial Regulation would be your resources for that. Okay. Um, real quick, I just wanted to, is anybody here experienced a fire event before? You've been in a building that's caught fire. Anybody here with fire service experience? Okay, so some of you have. All right. Um, I think one of the things that the, um, one of the things that the media does poorly is if you watch most television shows where they show a fire in a building, it's nice and bright, there's very little smoke. Um, any of you with fire service background knows that that is so far from the truth, it's not even funny. So one of the things I wanted to do here is I don't have any sound, but um, this particular video is uh, something called the Marble Mountain Burn. Basically what they did is they took two identical homes and they burnt both of them. They took temperature readings on both homes to see what the temperature readings and, and you can see as the rooms start to fill with smoke, what the conditions were like in each one of those. One of the homes was equipped with sprinklers, the other home wasn't. I'm not here to pitch sprinklers, I think they're an excellent idea. Um, but you can see the difference when we start to look at the comparison of the fire events between the two. So you can see the homes here that they burned. They're both identical in construction. Both have the same contents. So they didn't change the contents between the two buildings. They put the stuff in a building that you'd expect to see in an apartment building. The only difference was they put residential sprinklers in one and didn't put residential sprinklers in the other one. So it's a little bit messy, it looks like a typical teenager's bedroom. So look at the temperatures here, three feet off the floor at the start of the fire, 67 degrees. Now, you're gonna see the time lapse over there, that's from the point of ignition. So 55, 60 seconds later, almost 300 degrees at the ceiling level. A minute and 30 seconds, you're over a thousand degrees at the ceiling level. This is at the floor, so two minutes and 20 seconds at the floor level, 304 degrees. What happens if you breathe air at 304 degrees? Very Exactly. If water boils at 212 degrees, you have quite a bit of water in your lungs. So nine minutes from the point of ignition, the first fire unit's on scene. That's actually not a bad response time. Because if you think about your typical fire event without a fire alarm system, without a sprinkler system to give you that early notification, how soon after ignition do you think your typical fire is reported? Four or five minutes. In the state of Maine, the average response time for a fire department is six to eight minutes. Six to eight minutes is pretty good. So 
So in this particular case, the test were it took them 19 and a half minutes to get the fire under control. So we're going to see what happens in the sprinkled room, and we're going to see why the code allows more latitude or more flexibility in a, in a sprinkled building. So the temperature is rising. Maximum of 208 degrees at the ceiling level. 80 seconds later, that fire is pretty much out. So same exact contents in the building, but you can see how conditions deteriorated pretty quickly in the other one. Any guesses how long somebody could have survived in that other room? Nobody? 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, this is a good time of year to watch something like this. This is a dry Scotch pine tree. This was actually done by the National <coughs> Institutes of Standard and Testing. I'll tell you right now, you watch something like this, you go home and you water your Christmas tree. <coughs> So under a minute, that room is completely filled with smoke and is completely not survivable. Under a minute. Imagine something like that happening in the middle of the night. You know, I'm lucky if in the middle of the night I get up out of bed in 30, 45 seconds and I've got my wits about me. You know, that room is gone. It's completely gone. They, uh, they did testing. In 1975 and in 2006, they did testing on homes. The same couple, the same government organization NIST did testing in homes. 1975 and 2006. In 1975, from the point of ignition until the time that you had to get out of the building before escape was no longer possible was 11 to 12 minutes. Anybody want to guess what 2006 was? From the point of ignition until the time that escape was no longer tenable on your average building in 2006, three minutes. Why? Because of the contents of the furnishing. You have foam and seat cushions. Your average polystyrene sofa has more BTUs than a gallon of gasoline. You're using a lot of plastics. You know, go around your living room or your kitchen or your dining room and look at the amount of plastics that you have in your homes now. Plastics are basically solidified hydrocarbons. It's oil. So when it burns, it burns very quickly. The stuff that they're using in furnishings now, one of the things that's reduced the tenability times is the stuff they're using in furnishings gives off a large amount of carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and hydrogen sulfide. So, what we find when we go in and do, you know, look at a building after a fire event is more than 80% of the time, the victims have succumbed to fire gases. And we're able to tell that because of the post-mortem autopsies and finding out what they actually perish from. So it's the fire gases that are actually killing people. In the state of Maine, it's on average of more than 80% of fire victims is what, actually, what they actually died from. They basically inhale toxic gases. Do you gases. want me to go home and sleep tonight? <laughs> no, no. What I wanted to do is, you know, we looked at we looked at some of the code requirements for an apartment building and why it is why it is so important to have those protective measures in place because modern construction and modern furnishings are just they're so volatile that under three minutes to get out of the building. So obviously we want to protect life, we want to make sure that you are protected from liability to a certain degree as well. Um, 
You know, fire is definitely a very, very dangerous event in a building. And it gets to the point now, you know, when you're looking at three minutes to get out of the building, what's the chances that from the time of ignition until three minutes after a fire event occurs, the fire department's going to be on scene pulling people out of the building? A lot of good fire departments in the state of Maine. But three minutes? The chances of being able to save people you know, pull somebody out of a building. 11 minutes, 12 minutes might have been hard enough. Three minutes, almost impossible. So that's one of the things that we're here to talk to you about tonight. I hope you don't have it down anybody at bedtime story. All right. <laughs> I'll try to brighten it up. How's that? <laughs> uh, code compliant buildings. You see very, very little fire loss in a code compliant building. Um, in terms of actual loss of life. You may have some dollar loss. Um, for example, one of the things for a code compliant building, um, that the sprinkler video we just watched, the average insurance claim for a non sprinkle building is about $45,000 per fire event. So $45,000 worth of damage for your average insurance claim. In a sprinkle building, it's $4,000 of insurance claim on average. So you can see how taking those proactive steps can limit loss and also protect life as well. That's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Or do we want to wait until after everybody's? So my name is Larry French. I'm a disaster program manager for the Coastal Territory of the American Red Cross of Maine. So I cover Saginaw County all the way up to the Canadian border in Washington County. So I cover the entire coastline of Maine. I want to talk to you about two programs the American Red Cross does in relation to fire safety. So the American Red Cross mission. The American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in face of emergencies by mobilizing volunteers and the gener by mobilizing vol the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. The two words here that are most important are action words: prevents and alleviates. So we're going to talk about the two programs we use to prevent and alleviate human suffering. So the American Red Cross prevents. We look at staggering statistics like this. On average, seven people die in home fire every day in the United States. That number causes us to feel like we need to do something. Looking specifically at Maine, we find this fire in Caribou killed four people. We have a fire that killed five in Portland. We have a fire here in Herman that they said they found a smoke alarm that wasn't working. Then we have a fire in Surrey, they found a smoke alarm disconnected. So we found a lot of times smoke alarms make a difference. The state fire market, Thomas, yeah, Joe Thomas said that there are 2014, there were 25 deaths related to home fires. Of those 25 deaths, all but two of them were found to have faulty, missing, or disconnected smoke alarms. So we decided there's something has to change with smoke alarms and fire safety. So we started, in five years, our goal is reduce home fire deaths by 25%. And this is how we're doing. We're doing door-to-door -door campaign, where we're going to people and saying, can we inspect your smoke alarms? Can we teach you fire safety? Can we teach you about writing an escape plan? Can we help you practice a fire escape plan? We're doing a social media presence. We're doing advertising. Um, New York Stock Exchange, we did a uh, thing with New York Stock Exchange. We've done things in Times Square. We're doing a lot of public advertising around this campaign. Installing, inspecting, replacing batteries and smoke alarms, creating home fire escape plans, fire safety education, and then we're doing other disaster education, such as preparing for ice storms, hurricanes, floods creating disaster kits and other things to help people prepare for other disasters. This is one example of one of our, oh, and all of our services are free. All of our uh, home fire preparedness campaign services are free. This is one example of one of our social media campaign videos. It's thing.
And as they make their way through the front door, it looks like they're going to get to the family meeting place in the record time. What a drill for the Johnson family. Let's head down to the field to see how they think they did. And thanks, Bob. Flawless execution from the Johnson family. Jeremy Johnson, what'd you think of the drill? Wise words from a wise man. And to develop your fire safety game plan, visit redcross.org. Back to you, Bob. So we talked about fire safety education. We talked about making a plan, having two ways out of the house, things like that with folks. We give them educational material to tell them things like, you have as little as two minutes to get out of your house in a fire. So people who think that they have five or 10 minutes, you have that two minutes, or five, three minutes, according to the fire marshal's office. We also found that 82% of families have not practiced home fire drills, but 69% of them feel like they're, them and their children would know what to do in a fire alarm, but have never practiced it, so they don't know that for sure. So we give this information to families, as well as inspecting and ensuring they have smoke alarms in their house and they have the information they need to stay safe in a fire. So the other thing the American Red Cross does, the American Red Cross mediates. So after a fire, we have disaster responders, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, that respond to the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the ice storms, and single family, multi-family house fires. While I was driving here today, we got a call for a single family house fire in Lewiston. They were presenting a team too. We do about 400 fires a year, with a team of about 1,000 volunteers across the state. We provide financial assistance for food, clothing, shelters from their basic immediate needs. We provide recovery planning, casework, community referrals, as well as internal referrals to our own mental health, and disaster mental health, and disaster health services teams. So here's a short video about some statistics from our last year of providing services. So back to our mission table, there are two other phrases I just want to mention quickly. The American Red Cross prevents and alleviates human suffering in the face of emergency by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. The American Red Cross has done 90% of our work is done by volunteers. We rely heavily on volunteers to do our work. And all of our mission is funded by donors. We're not a federal agency. We're not funded in any way by the government. We're funded fully by donors. All of our services and staff services are always free. If you're interested in volunteering or donating the American Red Cross, you can go to our website, www.mainredcross.org. There's also information on our Home Fire Preparedness campaign there, as well as the other services the American Red Cross provides. Thank you, Larry. I want to just follow up with a, a kind of a stunning statistic that we at Bath Housing have seen locally. We've just launched a new program. Um, we're piloting a new program to help our elders in this area age in place, stay in their home longer. We've, um, since October 1st, we've been out to 14 homes and done aging in place assessments in these homes. These are uh, low income elderly people in the greater Bath area, all of our surrounding communities. Not one house that we have been in had adequate fire protection. Some of the houses we went into had no smoke detectors. So I'm just gonna make a plug this holiday season. The best gift you can give your loved ones, your family members, is to make sure they have working smoke detectors in their house. I'm just gonna follow that up with what Larry was saying. Um, don't assume, please don't assume. I think we can open it up for questions now. For any of our presenters. So 
Well, thank you for the presentations. Um, you know, I was thinking when Mark was talking during the presentation and you spoke up, our intent is not to scare anybody, but to educate people about a scary event. And anybody that has not been involved in a fire event and some of the things that, that we see through the fire service, it's very scary. They're life-changing events. Excuse me. Um, and they happen too often. 25 fire deaths in the state of Maine last year. And that overwhelming statistic of all but two had adequate protection. And so many people just take it for granted. I don't, I've never had a fire in my home. I don't know anybody that's ever had a fire in their home. But as you can see from some of the videos, it happens so fast that sometimes you just can't do anything about it if you're not adequately protected. That's why we stress those so much. <coughs> okay? Does anybody have any questions for myself or, or anybody? Yes? I have a question. Uh, what about the surrounding communities like West Bath? And, uh, I live in West Bath. Mm -hmm. The fire, the Bath Fire Department will respawn with a volunteer fire department in this bath that I'm aware of. The codes that we talked about, that we talked about earlier, do they apply also to these outlying communities or do they have a separate? The codes are going to be different in every community. They would. Okay. Um, one that I know of for sure is that any new residential construction requires a sprinkler system. Okay. And so the local or the town ordinance, even if it's stricter than yours, applies, correct? Correct. Like Mark said, if it's stricter than the state, okay. then the, the stricter one applies at the town. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. But, but the Mark's, the NFPA 101 is in effect statewide. I hope, I hope you took that from that. What he was talking about on the screen is affects statewide yeah. everywhere, every town, okay. whether you've adopted it locally or not. It sets a minimum, and the local authority can go stricter than the state requirement. Just can't go less strict than the state. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, I got one. Has Fire Department got any uh, program where they uh, provided with keys or something to get into some of these apartments without busting the doors down and breaking up the windows? Um, they can be. We have a system through the city uh, wow. called Knox Boxes. Pretty sure expensive. Uh, they are pretty expensive, but they're a very rugged box that you can put on the outside uh, of a building. And we have the only key, and uh, PD has a few as well, that can open that box. So you can put any keys that you want inside of that, and only we are going to be able to access it. Are you going to take the time to do it? Are we? Absolutely. They're everywhere, all throughout the city, and we use them all the time. If there's a fire ongoing, you're going to take the time to unlock the apartment? If there's... There's something to like We generally have enough personnel that somebody's going to be able to do it. If we believe that there's imminent life safety at risk, then no, we're probably going to break your door and anything else on the way to get to you, because that's what we do. Uh, when life safety is involved and we believe that, it's kind of a different ball game for us. Um, we will come thrashing through because... Do you have an estimate of the cost of those boxes? Um, I believe they're around $200. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're, they're only about this big. They're pretty discreet. And for uh, somebody, you'd have to be looking for them to find them. And they're generally bolted very heavily onto the front of the building by the front door. So we don't have to search around, you know, it's not something that you hide. It's something you put right by your front door and you can put any keys that you want to access it. And a good example is if your smoke alarm goes off and you're not home. Uh, this happens fairly often where a neighbor might call and say, you know, I can hear my neighbor's smoke alarm going off and you're not home. And we pull in and we don't see any smoke, any fire. We can hear a smoke alarm. We don't want to break your door or a window or anything to get in there, but at the same time, we have to confirm that it's a smoke alarm, not a carbon monoxide alarm, and that somebody's not down or injured inside the home. It's wonderful elderly. What's that? It's wonderful for the elderly. It is. And there's boxes all over town. A lot of the businesses have them. Uh, all the bath housing facilities have them. Uh, the high school, all the schools in bath, they, they all have them. With all these insulated windows and everything, uh, they're pretty expensive. Does the fire department have a practice of opening them rather than busting them up? Um, we do. Actually, once we're inside, they're actually a lot easier than an older single pane window um, because you can open them in 
and take them right out and yeah. set them aside and it takes less time than it does to break them and clean out the glass and there's risk, less risk for us. But like I said before, when life safety is involved, we do whatever we think is necessary and if we have to break something, we will because life safety is the most important thing. I went to one fire on multi-unit down on South Street quite a few years ago and uh, it was uh, up through the back of the shed, mostly in the attic. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the fire department went in the lower floors and put tops over the furniture. Yes. Those uh, are called salvage companies. I don't know if they still do that or not. We do. Um, we, we, it depends on what's going on. Like I said, life safety comes first, but we're also in the practice of preserving property. Well, there was many, anyway, mm -hmm. many, many uh, firemen. Uh, yes. And generally, when you have enough firemen to do that, is when you'll see it. And they'll, they'll look for things if they can talk to the homeowner first. Do you have anything of great value that you want us to get or cover or protect? You know, an old piano, things like that. And we'll use salvage covers and protect from not just smoking, heat damage, uh, well, but water. Down, down on the first yep. floor, that's, uh, Most of the damage that we do is actually done by the water because we need, it takes so much of it to put a fire out, especially he spoke to the materials um, inside. Now it's, everything burns so much faster and so much hotter um, that we need a lot of water to put them out. Anything else? Any other questions, points? Okay. Well, I'd like to thank Mark Stevens from the Fire Marshal's Office for being here. Scott Davis in the back from the City of Bath Code Enforcement. And Deborah Keller and her team from Bath Housing. Uh, if you have ever have any questions at all, call the fire department in relation to anything to do with fire safety. Um, we, we get questions all the time, and that's part of our job is um, to find out about these situations and, and try to educate the public as much as we can. So don't ever hesitate to call the department with a question. And if it's something that we don't know or don't have the authority to handle, then we have all these resources available to point you in the right direction. And that number is? 443-5034. Okay? Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Thank you.